How we doing? Good, man. Good. Good to see you all again. Last week was a great weekend. We adjusted our service times. 11.15 stayed the same, so it's a very easy adjustment for y'all, right? Uh, it was an amazing weekend. It was the largest non-holiday attendance ever in the history of our church, and so it was an amazing weekend. Yeah. Um, with that, though, obviously with a, a ton of people coming, especially at 11.15 service, it means we always have to, uh, to try and continue to make adjustments. And so I just want to say this. If you attend the 9.45 or this service, the 11.15, uh, you serve in it or whatever, uh, we are really needing people to move to our 8.15 service. It's a great service there. Uh, and so if you're attending a service, this service, obviously you're attending because you're listening, uh, and not serving, and you can come to the earlier service, that would be amazing. Uh, because this is the service where most of our guests come. And so we want to continue to make room for them. And, and this is our 13-year anniversary weekend as a church. And so it's just been amazing, yeah, to see... See how God has just moved in the life of our church and how he is moving, man. It's just an amazing, uh, amazing thing to see and to be a part of. Uh, and we started the series Awkward last weekend talking about things that we don't want to talk about. And, and most of the time, if we're honest, we don't want to talk about them in church. And so if you were here last weekend, we, we discussed struggles and addictions and how all of us struggle with sin. All of us are, are not immune to that. And so it's something we've got to be honest about as Christians that, hey, we struggle. Sometimes, like Paul said in Romans 7, we don't understand our own actions. We don't even understand what we do. Why do we do the things that we hate? But it's in that honesty that we find help. We find grace. And this weekend, we're going to talk about another subject that, that so often is like taboo to talk about in church, and that's depression and anxiety. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Psalm 42. That's where we're going to hang out for a while. Uh, and then we'll move to Psalm 94, then move into the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But as we prepare for this, as we uh, talk about these awkward things, uh, this week, and like I said, depression and anxiety, next week we're going to talk about marriage and relationships and divorce. And so really looking forward to that one. The week after, we're going to talk about uh, finances and financial stewardship and, and really look at this to say, how do we be uh, good financial stewards? And then lastly, we're going to talk about prejudices and discrimination. And in light of the despicable things that happened yesterday in Virginia, I think it's very important for us to talk about as a church. And so a lot of awkward things for us to talk about. All right. Uh, but I'm praying that they will be helpful for us because when we begin to talk about them and have honest conversations about them, then we can seek the solutions together. We can find help in our time of need. All right. So let's go this week. Psalm chapter 42, dealing with depression and anxiety. What we're going to see is in the Psalms. And if you were here last summer, we did a series on the Psalms, and, and my point in that whole series was, you see in the book of Psalms just about every human emotion you can imagine, from depression and anxiety to anger. I mean, a third of the Psalms are the psalmist saying, hey, God, kill all my enemies. And so he struggles with anger. Uh, and so you see just about every human emotion, and it teaches us how to process them and how to pray them. The Psalms are meant to be prayed. And so when you think about this Psalm in Psalm 42, you're going to see kind of gut level honesty, but it's so good for us because that's what we need. We need to know, you know what? It's okay to feel like this. It's okay to pray this. So look at what he says, starting in verse one, we'll work our way down to verse six. He says, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God, my soul thirst for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So you see right off here that the psalmist is, is dealing with some deep things. He's talking about what his soul thirsts for. And, and he's using the analogy of a deer who pants after water. As, as my kids would say when they haven't eaten in a couple hours, Dad, I'm starving. I'm like, you're not really starving. That doesn't happen for like a month, right? Uh, but, but it's this idea of I'm craving, so I need something. So his soul is in need is what he's saying. I am thirsting after God. He said, when can I come and meet with God? And then he says this in verse three, which I think is so helpful. He says, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Now, context of chapter 42, he's talking about people who are talking about him, leveling insults against him and what that's doing to his own soul. And when he says here in verse three, my tears have been my food day and night, 
I think he's literally saying, man, this has led to me not eating. I'm not healthy. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. And I don't know where the mess God is. Literally, that phrase, where is your God, is translated a better way to say it is, what is your God doing? Have you ever felt like where you're like, what is God doing? I don't understand what he's doing. I do not understand this. All, I just feel like I'm crying all the time. My, my worst enemy is my own brain. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand the circumstances. And contextually, when he says they talk to me, he could be referring to his tears or he could be referring to the people that are taunting him. And I think either explanation is fine because it could be the people talking to him and his tears are saying what they're saying or repeating what they're saying. And so his tears are talking to him. Now you might th- uh, think that somebody who has self-talk is crazy, but can we just be honest? We, we like hear things in our heads, don't we? Maybe I'm the only crazy one, right? But our tears talk to us. Troubles Talk to us. We, we now know in psychology this is actually healthy. It's self-talk. The problem is a lot of times the self-talk is always negative. And I, and I think that's a reference to what he's saying. He's, my, my tears are my food day and night and they're talking to me. And all they're saying to me is, where is your God? What is your God doing? And so he's in a moment of despair. He's in a moment of desperation. Later, he's going to use the word turmoil. His soul's in turmoil. And what I think is so incredibly helpful for Christians is to understand, you know what? Christians get depressed too. For so long in churches, we have somehow thought that if you were Christian and depressed, then you were less than. Or you didn't have enough faith. But do you understand there are some things you just can't pray away? There are some distresses, some turmoils that, that come into our life. And, and a lot of times they're not even a result of sin necessarily. Just circumstances in our lives. Or, or it could even go deeper than that. It could even go into biology and how we were made. In fact, we now know, and, and, and I'm going to preface this, I'm not a doctor at all. But Lindsay and I, my wife, we went to a retreat a couple summers ago that that a ministry in Colorado puts on. It's amazing for pastors and their spouse to get away and process the rigors of ministry. So to deal with our own soul, because it's so easy just to help everybody else. And so Lindsay and I went, and while we were there, we processed a lot about our own personality, about our pains. And one of the things that I learned there that was so incredibly helpful is that there's Two kinds of depression. I'm going to give you the technical words here just so I can sound smart, right? But I will explain them to you. That was meant to be funny. I'm not really trying to sound smart. But the two types of depression are endogenous and exogenous. What that means is fancy words for saying internal and external. So in, ex. There are reasons, internal reasons for depression, What I mean by that is this, and again, I'm I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm just trying to observe and learn. But what that means is there can be internal reasons, physiological reasons that we struggle with depression. It could be a brain chemistry thing. We we now know, I'm so grateful for the, the, the neurology and the brain science that's been done over the last several years. I mean, we've really come a long way in understanding things. And so it literally could be a brain chemistry thing. And that is just a result of biology, how we're put together. In the same way, somebody could be born a diabetic. That's just genetically. I mean, my father was an alcoholic, so I'm genetically predisposed to that. And so there could be genetic reasons, DNA reasons, internal reasons, brain chemistry reasons as to why we experience depression. And so I want you to hear me say this. It is incredibly harmful to tell somebody who may be depressed for internal reasons that they are somehow less than. We wouldn't say that to somebody who had diabetes that was born with that. Like we wouldn't stigmatize that. 
But when it comes to emotions, we stigmatize it like they're somehow subhuman. Like if, if they could just get it together like the rest of us. You know what I'm saying? And again, this is where you, you got to go to a doctor. You could need medication. I mean, that's a valid, legit thing. But then there's also exogenous, which is external depression. What that means is it's reactive. It's circumstantial because of what's going on in your life. It could lead to depression. And so think about it like this. Every human being, whether internally or externally, at some time in their life are going to experience depression, anxious thoughts, getting to a place to where like my own mind is just talking to me, my tears talking to me. I feel like I'm going crazy. It could be circumstantial. It could be because of external factors. It could be because of internal ones. Let me give you a, an example, a personal example from myself. Several years ago, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine who's also a Christian psychologist, and, and he helped me understand myself so much because he was explaining to me how when you preach, and, and I may have said this before, but when you preach a 30-minute sermon, it is the equivalent adrenaline in your body of a car wreck. And so I was speaking to him and I said, so that means I have three car wrecks a Sunday. <laughs> I used to preach five, man. I was really messed up then. We broke it up over two days. I've done four all in the, when we were at the conference center, I preached four sermons every Sunday morning for over two years. So what that means is my body, again, if you think of this as zero, spikes with adrenaline on Sunday. I mean, car wreck after car wreck after car wreck. It's the fight or flight syndrome, right? And we can't live off adrenaline. And he said, Jason, here's what you need to understand about yourself, though. That once you start coming down off of that, you don't go back to zero. Your body, and this was the language he used, your body actually puts yourself in a semi-depressed state where you actually go below zero, and it takes you about 24 hours for your body to balance itself back out. And so when he said that to me, I was like, no wonder I'm so depressed on a Sunday evening and a Monday. No wonder I feel so worn out on a Sunday. I mean, my adrenaline, I had three car wrecks. This is why you don't want to meet with me on a Sunday evening or even a Monday morning. I don't make any major decisions in my life during that time period. My, my family could tell you like, yeah, we just want him to sleep and eat something and then sleep again, right? I don't even come into the office on Monday mornings for the sake of the sanity of our staff so they don't have to deal with me in that time. But here's what that did for me. Here's what I'm saying. That means every weekend I experience a certain type of depression. You know how healthy that was for me to understand that about myself? And that's just preaching. That's a, that's a good thing. It's just, but it has a physiological effect on my body. So what if it was a negative thing like cancer or job loss or worse yet, the loss of a loved one? Like we are fooling ourselves if we think that circumstances don't cause depression. Don't cause us to despair and doubt and feel like, man, I don't know if this is going to get any better. And so again, as Christians, we can never have this stigmatism like it's somehow not okay to struggle with this. Or you're somehow less than if you're depressed. I mean, think about it as a Christian. If you, there's kind of this prevailing thought in church. If you say, I'm depressed, then people are going to think, oh, you don't know Jesus. No, I can love Jesus and struggle with it. That's what the psalmist is saying here. He said, I, where's God? I don't know where he's at, but I want God, but all I'm is crying. I'm in turmoil. So healthy to own that. Now he goes on, look at this in verse four. He said, these things I remember as I pour out my soul how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Now what he's doing here is incredibly helpful and super practical. That's why it's so helpful. 
He's remembering back to the times when he wasn't depressed. Remembering back to the times when his soul wasn't in turmoil, when his soul was with the people of God in the house of God, leading him in worship of God. Now here's why this is so important. When we get into these dark nights of the soul, as one theologian called it, when we get into these places and times, again, it can be internal, external, what tends to happen is we tend to hyperbole things. And I don't even know if that's how you say it, but the point is we, we tend to make them bigger than, we are, than they are. This is what happens when, when married people get in conversations and they say things like in an argument, you always or you never. And anybody who's been in those arguments, which is just about everybody uh, in the room, whether you're married or not, when someone says that to you, don't you take issue with the fact that they say always or never? Like you totally miss the fact that you didn't do it this one, but you don't always do that. There was at least one time when you didn't, right? But what tends to happen in, in those heated exchanges is, you know, we use hyperbolic language. That's the better way of saying it. You always, you never. This is why a good counsel would tell you don't use those words. And so what I'm saying here is when we get in these moments of darkness and depression, that's what we do. We think this is never going to end. This is all there is. What the psalmist is saying is he's remembering back. This is not how it always is. And, and this is why this is so important. I want to point it out. I love how he says the keeping festival, which means those are rituals or uh, festivals that they would keep, pilgrimages that they would make every year to the house of God. And since he had a regular habit of doing that, now in a moment when he's not worshiping with God's people, those habits that he kept are now keeping him. They are now holding him. Let me say it to you like this. It is so good to have a rhythm of being in the house of God, which is the people of God, not the building, but the people of God, gathering together as the people of God, worshiping God. The reason why that's so important is because if you and I don't have a good, healthy rhythm of doing that, then when stuff falls apart in our life later, we won't have foundations to go back to. Make sense? So here's what I'm saying to you. Right now in your life, by you being here, this is a good thing because this is another rock in the foundation that you might need tomorrow. You might need a month from now. You might need three years from now. Who knows? But the seeds you're planting now will bear fruit later. And so the point of it is you and I in the midst of struggling with depression, if we don't have a backlog of memories of, of foundational things that God has done in our lives, then we tend to feel hopeless. We tend to feel like there's no hope. It's always been like this and therefore it will always be like this. But the psalmist is reminding us, no, it hasn't always been like this. Therefore, it won't always be like this. Look at what he says next in verse five and six. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Now he's starting to doubt his doubts. Now he's starting to question his questions, which is good. Because he was asking the question, where is your God? Where is my God? When can I meet him? When can I see him? And now what he's saying is he's questioning his questions. He's doubting the doubts, the turmoil within him. He's saying to himself, here's what I want you to see. When the tears talk, we got to learn how to talk back. Again, this is healthy self-talk. When our tears talk to us, we must learn how to speak truth to our souls. In fact, that's my point for today's message. You might want to write it down. When tears talk to us, and they will talk to you, if they haven't talked to you yet, you just have not lived long enough, my friend. They'll talk to you. And when they do, we have to learn how to speak truth back to our souls. This is called preaching to yourself. We don't always like somebody else preaching to us, right? You understand how like that's such a negative thing and it makes my job hard? People are like, don't preach to me. Don't preach at me. Well, that's what I do. I'm a preacher. But, but here's what I've learned. You know what helps me be 
and become a better preacher is when I think to myself, okay, how would I like for me to preach to me? How would I want somebody to say this to me? But if I didn't have a good habit of preaching the truth to myself, then I wouldn't be very good at preaching it to you. And what I'm saying to you is this. We have to learn how to preach truth. And the truth is what the psalmist says, hope in God. Hope in God. Hope in God. The word in is the preposition. And the preposition always shows the relationship between two words. So you got hope and you got God. And what he's saying is, listen, it's in God, my hope. God is my hope. And here's what I want you to hear me say. It is okay to feel helpless. Okay to feel helpless. But it's never okay to feel hopeless. There's a difference. And I want you to understand that difference so that when the feelings of helplessness come, you're not so clouded in darkness to where you don't know the truth that God is still with you. And if God is still with you, then you still have hope. And, and, I, and I get this is like a tension and it's like a place that we live and that's just where we're called to live. To admit our helplessness, you know, I'm helpless, I'm in turmoil, I can do nothing about this, but guess what? I'm in relationship with the one who can. I'm hoping in him. And I love how he says it, I shall again praise him. Notice that's future. He's not praising him now. Again, I don't always like the, crazy, the cheesy Christian saying, just praise God. Well, I don't feel like doing that right now, man. Have you prayed about it? Nope, I don't want to talk to him. Have you ever felt like that? You haven't walked with God long enough. But what do you tell yourself in that moment? I don't feel like doing it. I feel helpless, but you know what? I'm not hopeless. One day I will praise him again. Hope in God. And see, this is written as a command. It's very interesting. The psalmist is commanding himself to do something he doesn't want to do. That is maturity. That is growing. When I can start to command myself to do it, even though I don't want to do it. And I love that because what the psalmist is saying is, you know what? I used to praise him. I'm not right now, but I know I'm going to. This is not the end is what he's saying. See, when hope dies, when hope dies, your soul dies. And when your soul dies, you've got nothing to live for. And so what I'm saying is it's very honest. It's very healthy to recognize depression, to recognize it could be internal. It could be external. It could be things beyond your control in both circumstances. But when we are honest about that, we also have to remember, yeah, this is my current reality, but it may not always be my reality. In fact, in faith, I'm going to claim already that it's not always going to be my reality. That's where the faith comes in. The faith comes in when we preach to ourselves and we say, you know what, this is where I'm at right now, but I believe one day, at some point, I'll be praising God again. So it's okay to feel helpless, man. It's just not okay to feel hopeless. There's a difference. Now flip over to Psalm 94. I want to show you what I mean by that. Uh, again, the psalmist writes, you just go to the right out of, out of Psalm 42, several chapters, Psalm 94. I, I love the honesty, but I love what we see this. This is the this is the hope in the midst of the helplessness. Psalm 94, verses 17 through 19 says this. If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. Now, to all you mothers out there, you got young kids, you're like, oh, that would be heaven. Like the land of silence, that's, that would be awesome. <laughs> that's not what he's saying. The, the reference here is to the grave, to death. He said, if God had not been my help, my soul would have died, is what he's saying. 
Verse 18, when I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. Now that phrase there, when I thought, it'd be better translated when I cried out. When I cried out, my foot slips. And this is not like, oh, my foot slipped. This is not like walking up the stairs and you slip and then you look around to see if anybody noticed. This is not that, all right? And, and pr- hopefully they didn't notice because then you can move on and just laugh at yourself, right? This is him saying, no, I'm not just my foot slipping. This is me saying my foundation has given way. The foundation that I'm standing on. And then he says this, if it had not been for the steadfast love My soul would have died, but thank God you held me. I love that picture. You held me. Jesus says, those God put in my hand, no one can snatch them out of. So the hope is this, that even in the midst of your helplessness, God holds you. He's got you. And since he's got you, there's still hope to keep living to keep moving forward, to not let this feel like it's the end. For again, I shall praise him. Now he goes on, look at verse 19. He says, when the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Now this phrase, cares of my heart, it didn't quite translate in English. It's like, oh, the cares of my heart, so pretty. No, what he's talking about here is literally troubled or anxious thoughts. Listen to this definition. The processing of information which causes distress and anxiety in one's mind and heart. Think about this. The processing of information which causes anxiety. Does that not describe what a lot of us do in our minds? See, we have this habit of rewinding and replaying. Rewinding what that person said and replaying it and coming to our own conclusions. Rewinding what happened, replaying it. Rewinding, replaying. Satan is good at rewinding and replaying. And what I'm saying to you is if you've never felt like your worst enemy was your mind, then then you haven't really wrestled with helplessness. He's saying, I have these troubled, anxious thoughts. And when they were many... So why I love the Bible. He's admitting, man, I have many troubling, anxious thoughts. So honest. But then he says this, your consolations cheered my soul. Now, consolation a lot today is used in a negative sense. Like we give people consolation prizes. You know what I mean? And a consolation prize is for the loser who couldn't hack it. And so we feel bad. We give him a prize, right? We call those participation trophies, which I am not for those. Even though, you know, in PE growing up, I could have gotten a participation trophy because when it came to running, I didn't get any trophies. This is not a runner's body, right? If I had a sticker, it'd be 0.0 on my truck, right? I do not run. But that's not what the Bible is saying here. When he says your consolations, he's not talking about God's pity for you. But again, as Christians, is that not how we look at people that are quote unquote depressed a lot? Oh, let's, we got consolation prizes for them. They're, those are the losers who can't hack it like the rest of us. Those are the ones who are struggling and, and if they could just get their life together. And, and really what they're saying is if they could just be as awesome as me. It's not what the psalmist is saying. The word consolation means comfort encouragement. What he's telling us is, listen, when you get to a helplessness, everybody else has let you down. God is still there to comfort you. He has not left you and he will not forsake you. And sometimes he changes the circumstances and sometimes he just gives you grace in the midst of them. Either way, he's good. Now I'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to make the point. I'm going to give you scriptures to the point that I just made. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, originally when I was 
kind of thinking through this message. I knew I wanted to preach out of Psalm 42, but I hadn't really thought about 2 Corinthians 12. But when I was looking at it, I was like, man, this really kind of weaves together. And I want to do my best to try to weave it together for you. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who we looked at last week in Romans 7, is discussing a conversation he had with the Lord about a struggle. He calls it a thorn. And I think it's appropriate to bring it up in this conversation because a lot of times that's what depression is, anxiety. It's this thorn in our side that we so desperately want to go away. But look at the conversation that Paul tells us about that he had with God, starting in verse seven. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now, a couple things there. We don't know what the thorn is. Paul doesn't tell us. And we could speculate all day what it is. We don't know. It could be several things. It could be a sin struggle like we talked about last week. It could be a physical ailment because we know Paul was you know, shipwrecked and all kinds of other things. He was beaten. Uh, it could have been insults. It could have been some kind of emotional struggle that Paul was having. It could be literally depression and anxiety. We don't know. Nor do we need to know because it doesn't really matter what it is. What we need to know is that God brought it. If you don't have, hear me, if you don't have in your theology that God can use thorns in your life, that when they come, and I could say storms as well, then you'll reject God because you won't see how in the world he is good. But Paul understood something. It was given to him by God, but in that, he was saying he was a messenger of Satan to harass me. Now, again, we don't know. We don't know how this works. I do know that for a Christian, Satan cannot possess you. The Holy Spirit is in you. He cannot possess you, but he can harass you. And how he harasses us, I believe, is in our minds. I think you see this again. Even in the Bible, when Satan speaks to people, we don't always know if he's there in physical form or if it's just in their mind. So when Jesus was tempted, we don't know if, if Satan was really there or if it was just thoughts because you know we don't fight flesh and blood. Principality, spirits of the air. So we know he's a spirit. We know he's here, but we don't see him. And so it could just be he's talking to us. And so here's what I think we need to understand. You can have, as a Christian, satanic thoughts evil thoughts and they come into your mind and and Satan just kind of lobs these arrows into our minds all the time. And we have to decide if we're going to believe them because then once we believe them, we act on them. So it goes from a thought to a belief to an action. So what that means is every action is coming from some underlying belief. And every belief is coming from some underlying thing that's been told to you. This is why God, when he spoke to Adam and Eve after they sinned, he said, who told you that? Whose lie did you believe? It's not that God didn't know, but he was asking them the question so that they could understand you believed the wrong person. You believed the wrong truth. So therefore, it has devastating consequences. So here's what I want you to see. It is very likely for you and I to have thoughts in our minds that are not from God that will lead to destruction. And so we have to learn how to filter those. And we filter them by the word of God. We say, would God tell me this? Would God say that to me? So we don't know what the thorn was. All we know that It was harassing Paul. So much so, look at this in verse eight. Three times, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Man, if you haven't prayed over and over again for God to take something from you, then I just don't think you've walked with him long enough. You're like, no, everything between me and God's good. No, you know how many things I have begged God to take away? 
See, when I first trusted Christ, there were some desires for, t- for sin and temptation that God just took away. I didn't desire them anymore. But then there's some that he just left. And for years and years and years, I begged God to take them away until I found 2 Corinthians 12. Some things God says, I'm not gonna take it away, but here's what I'll do. Look at this, verse nine. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then I began to understand something about myself. There are some struggles, sin, depression, that if God took them away, then God would be taking away the very thing that forces me to rely on him. He'd be taking away the very thing that is perfecting his power in me. This word made perfect means to accomplish through. So, so often we are asking God to take things away and in his viewpoint of things, he's saying, if I take this away, it's going to stunt your own growth. I'm making my power perfect in this weakness. So then Paul goes on, look at this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now that word there, rest, is very interesting. It's interesting to me that when Chris was doing the awkward silence thing at the beginning of the sermon, or the beginning of the service, he's talking about rest. We can just rest in that God is here. See, that's what we all want. But Paul discovered a secret that so many of us have not discovered. It's not in spite of our weaknesses that we get to rest. It is because of them. It is only through them that we can get rest. How does that work? This word here, rest, means a controlling influence over. The idea of it, it's like a word picture. If you have an area and you set up a tent over that, then the tent is covering the area. And so as long as you're underneath the tent, you're protected. And so what Paul is saying that he discovered the secret to contentment is being under the shelter of God. Well, what is it that got him underneath the shelter? Look at the last verse, verse 10. He says, for the sake of Christ, then I am content. What a weird word. I'm content. See, most of us are like, I'm content with the house in the woods. I'm content with a nice car, with weighing a certain amount, with looking a certain way. But listen to what Paul's content with. He says, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. What a weirdo. (laughs) But why is he content there? Look, for when I am weak, then I am strong. What does that mean? See, a lot of us don't believe that statement. We don't believe that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. We think it's our weaknesses that are actually making us not strong. And so therefore, we need to shore up the weaknesses. We need to become a better person. But no, Paul, again, think about it like this, the tent. He's saying the tent is is the strength. But what gets me under the tent is I'm weak. That's what forces me to get underneath and to seek shelter. And the storms of life are what force me to get there. And so simultaneously, this is crazy. Simultaneously, he's weak. He's under the tent, but the tent is over him. So he's strong. So he's weak and strong at the same time. So now apply this to struggles, apply this to depression. It's not in spite of those things that make you strong. It's because of those things. Because it's in those things that God's power is accomplished in you. Because if you didn't have that struggle, if you didn't have that thorn, Paul says you'd be an arrogant jerk. And isn't that how most Christians are? Like, oh, sucks to be you. Man, that's, I mean, you got, you're alcoholic, you struggle with addictions, you're depressed, man. That's, oh, if you could just be more like me. Mm-mm. Actually, the people who struggle the most are the strongest in the sight of God. Why? Because they are no longer under any illusions that it was their strength that got them there. 
that it was their abilities that got them there. Paul's saying, I will boast now. I'll brag about how weak I am. When have you ever heard a Christian do that? Dude, I'm the weakest person I know. That's what we should be saying. Man, I am a jacked up mess, but thank God for Christ. Thank God for grace. Because without Christ, I'd be left alone in a field. No protection, no strength. Because of God, though, sending his son Christ, I can rest. Why? Because I have hope. Why? Because I know that the cross is not the end of the story. The cross is not the end. Death is not the end. Despair is not the end. Depression is not the end. And, and I, it's a weird place to live in where you're saying, I'm helpless, but I'm hopeful because Sunday's coming and God will raise me anew. And this is where Christians so misquote Romans 8.28. I'll do a whole sermon on this sometime. I don't know when. But Romans 8.28, he says, we know all things work together for good. People misquote that all the time when something bad happens. They're like, I've got to work this for good. That's not the point. That's still a bad thing. That bad thing will never be a good thing. That is not what he's saying there. It's a bad thing when somebody dies. It's a bad thing when you get cancer. It's a bad thing when you're depressed. Now the hope is that that's not the end. That one day in the end, God will undo what has been done. As Revelation says, he will wipe away every tear. That's the hope. Well, how can he wipe away a tear? How can he wipe away a tear if we've never cried him? And then for all eternity, we will never doubt like Adam and Eve did because we will know what it was like without God. And when God gives us commands, we will always obey them for the rest of eternity because we will know what it was like to be helpless and we don't want to go back there. See, the hope of the gospel is this is not the end. Yes, I'm depressed. And as a Christian, I can say that. Yes, I'm struggling, and I can say that because the grace of God is with me, and God is for me, and if he's with me, you know, the verse continues in Romans 8, 28. He says, those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. That's the hope that God will finish what he started, and if that's the case, I'll boast about my weaknesses, man. Because when I'm weak, then I am strong.